Well, this evening we are pressing further into questions of forgiveness. Last week, uh, if you haven't heard it, it's online. You can listen to it on our YouTube channel. It's on our podcast as well, which is on Apple Podcasts and Spotify for those who are on the cutting edge of technology. Uh, But regardless, that question that we addressed last week was why forgive? You know, that's a big question. A lot of people don't like to forgive or don't think forgiveness is good. So why forgive? In brief, we heard a two-part answer. And first, it's because God and Christ forgave us. And second, it's so that when we forgive others, indeed, we are assured that we too have been forgiven. God forgives us because of Jesus, and in return, he expects us to forgive others. And although that's the right and true answer, we still have a lot of follow-up questions to this complex topic. We could say, why forgive? Well, because Jesus says, forgive, and we could leave it at that. And that would be true, but it would help us, again, to dive in deeper. So tonight we're tackling a big question. What is forgiveness, actually? What does it look like? What does it entail? How do we define it? And by whose authority do we define it? Next week, we'll look at the flip side of that question. This is just as important. What is forgiveness? Yes, but next week, what forgiveness is not? Namely, forgiveness does not mean that we have a miscarriage of justice, that we ignore legal consequences or certain social consequences for sins or or errors, or, or that we don't establish some sort of harmful social practice where people can repeatedly abuse and terrorize people and just say, I'm sorry, or forgive me, and then get away with it. So we'll discuss that too. That's an important part of this question. And then week four, probably something that we're all looking forward to, is the more practical question of how Christians forgive. We'll learn some basics, or relearn some basics maybe, Things like how to apologize and why we ought to apologize and ask for forgiveness. And then we'll talk about the more difficult stuff, how to grant forgiveness, how to live out forgiveness. So that will be how Christians forgive. And finally, we want to conclude this all in week five by summarizing it, everything that's come before by talking about how God forgives us. This is really the beginning and the end of the forgiveness question. It's what God has done and what God will do for us. And that allows us to leave behind maybe a past of of trauma and baggage and hurt and all that stuff to enter into a hope-filled future where God has forgiven and we can forgive too. Well, my goal is to reintroduce us not just to the theology but to the practice of forgiveness. It's really easy to talk about forgiveness in the abstract. You know, when you put the uh, rubber to the road of forgiveness, it's a difficult thing. We feel in our bones how starved we are for it, though. We see how hostile so many have become to it. And my thesis is that uh, this idea of forgiveness is absolutely core to our faith. It's the heart of Christianity. And without it, we really are doomed, not just ourselves, but our society as well. So let's start to define and understand what this forgiveness is. Now, there is a famous work by a man named Simon Wiesenthal, who was an Austrian Jew and a survivor of the Holocaust, and his work is called The Sunflower. Uh, In it, he tells the story of sitting with a Nazi who, on his deathbed some years after World War II, begged this man's forgiveness for what he and other Nazis like him had done to the Jewish people. Now, Weisenthal had never met this man before, but he had experienced what he and his regime had done. Weisenthal was overwhelmed by this moment. Now, he had survived. He was left standing so that he could forgive, but 88 members of his immediate and extended family did not live to see this moment. And it's because of men like this Ultimately, after listening to this man pour his heart out, Weisenthal maybe held his hand on occasion or gave him a drink of water when his throat got dry. He ultimately sat there in silence the whole time. Again, overwhelmed by what he was experiencing. And that night, the man died. And he actually had willed away all of his earthly belongings to Weisenthal, who ended up just deciding not to to take any of that stuff. But ultimately, he 
leaves that situation with a question kind of haunting him. And he poses it to the reader as well. He says this, Ought I to have forgiven him? Was my silence at the bedside of this dying Nazi right or wrong? The crux of the matter is, of course, the question of forgiveness. Forgetting is something that time alone can take care of, but forgiveness is an act of volition. And only the sufferer is qualified to make the decision. You who have just read this sad and tragic episode of my life can mentally change places with me and ask yourself this crucial question. What would I have done? Ultimately, Weisenthal goes on to ask over 50 prominent thinkers in the world, Jews, Christians, Muslims, atheists, philosophers, professors, rabbis, pastors, imams, writers, so many people. He asked them to respond, what would you have done if you were me? Could a Jewish survivor of the Holocaust forgive a Nazi who had done all of these things? Well, in his survey, 28 of those respondents, remember these are world-class thinkers, widely respected for their contributions to human society. They're not just random people in the street. 28 of those over 50 responses said, no, it's impossible to actually forgive this person. Nine of them ultimately were just really not sure, but you could understand why they would maybe lean towards no. And finally, 16 of them said, yes, it is possible. But what's interesting in that response is the breakdown of who said what. Of the 16 who said, yes, it's, a, it's possible to forgive a Nazi, as a survivor of the Holocaust, or it's possible to experience something so deeply inhumane and to turn to the face of your oppressor and say, I forgive you. 26, or rather 16 of those, only Buddhists and Christians said that it was possible. But here's what's interesting. Of all the Buddhist responses, essentially, and this is maybe, you know, Removing some of the nuance from the question, most of them said that essentially that evil is actually a non-existent illusion of our reality. So evil's not even really a thing. And so there's really nothing ever for any of us to forgive because evil is a substanceless thing. Now, it's easy for us to say, well, that's obviously a naive answer, but some Christian theologians I think are kind of on to something when they see sin is not any substantive thing. It's rather the absence of God's goodness. Sin is not its own entity or reality. It's just a distortion of what God has made good. And I think that's a, that's a compelling answer to what sin is. If only God can create, the devil can't create sin. Sin is just, just existence without God's grace to, to, to illumine it. And I think there's something compelling about that. However, Really, at the end of the day, that's a, not a very helpful answer, I would say. The Christian response, although it was varied in his, uh, in his survey, essentially agreed that forgiveness, although painful, although difficult, although costly, it is possible. But what it is, what it, or rather, what is it that distinguishes Christians from others? So why is it that any of our our atheist or Muslim or Jewish friends might say, no, you can't possibly forgive. Why is it that only Christians could possibly make this audacious claim and unpopular belief that you really can forgive something that evil? Where does that idea even come from that they would think that? Well, where are they getting their sources from? Well, I believe and will argue that the right answer to that question is that our understanding of forgiveness comes to us from our understanding of God's own nature, which is revealed firstly to us in Scripture, Old Testament and New, and secondly and more perfectly in the person and work of Jesus. That's what distinguishes Christians and their authority uh, to speak on this issue from anybody else, is that we have the scriptural witness that points us to Jesus. That's why we can say boldly, and maybe even offensively to some, yes, you can forgive these things. And so with that in mind, we'll get into these two scripture passages being Exodus 34 and Mark 1. But in both cases, I think we find the idea 
of God and his forgiveness proclaimed by two of the great prophets in scripture. One is at the very beginning of Israel's story. It's Moses. This is, this is coming on the tail end of uh, their salvation from Egypt and before they're even in the promised land. I mean, this is really kind of the beginning of Israel's story as a people group. And then we get the other prophet at the other end of the Old Testament. Some theologians say, well, you know, John the Baptist really was the last Old Testament prophet. He was the last one coming, proclaiming the name of the, the, name of the Lord in a very um, Isaiah way in the first few verses of Mark. He was, he was making uh, the way for the Messiah. He was out of the wilderness proclaiming him. And we see that hope was promised in Isaiah. And, and John is the last one to do it before Jesus reveals himself or who he is through the cross and the empty tomb. So Moses and John, respectively, who stand at sort of the beginning of Israel's story and the beginning of the church's story, help us to see that the story of Scripture from beginning to end is one, ultimately, of forgiveness. It's radically concerned with forgiveness. No matter what epic, and I say that the E-P-O-C-H, epic, that time period, not the other one, um, any epic that you find in the Bible, any moment is all bound up and wrapped up in the forgiveness of God. So Moses, for instance, you know, he is not only this great prophet, but he is the author of, uh, of the first uh, five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, as we call it, or the Torah. Of course, Joshua is his assistant. Of course, through, throughout Israel's centuries, they had scribes and, 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 and priests and and people that would go in and compile the book, you know, but this is taking from the authority, the voice of Moses. And he tells the story from Genesis to Deuteronomy of the forgiving God. Here's a God who creates a humanity so that they might share in his glory. But he finds early on that his creations rebel against him with Adam and Eve. And then through the children of Adam and Eve go on until they become the children of Abraham. And, uh, and they have all these, their own sets of problems, their own sins, yet the Lord is forever pursuing them. And he's, uh, he's ultimately the, the great climactic event in some sense. One of the, the key points in all of scripture historically is that God intervenes when his people are enslaved delivers them from their bondage and gives them a home and a law and reveals their mission to be a light to the nations for the glory of God. And so that is the story that Moses tells and it's one that's all wrapped up with forgiveness. You cannot read the first five books. Uh, In fact, when I was looking at the the Hebrew words for forgiveness, I thought it would, you know, they appear everywhere in the Old Testament, but my goodness, are they really front loaded into the Torah? But then you get down past the long, tumultuous history of, of, of Israel when they're established in the story, past David and past Solomon, past Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther and Ruth and all those people. And you see that they're a failure of a people, really, time and again. And after 400 years of relative prophetic silence, then John comes out of a, like a, like a, like a, bullets speeding his way out of a pistol, just cutting right into the heart of Israel again. And he's telling the story of God and his people again. But now he is making the focal point, not about what God has done in the past, uh, but what God is about to do in this very next moment. And that is through the person of Jesus Christ. Despite how God has worked through patriarchs, judges, priests, kings, prophets, They could not save themselves. None of those leaderships, none of those authority structures, none of those traditions could save them from their enemy's sin and death. Only Jesus, who is the Son of God and man, can accomplish a final and lasting forgiveness that we can actually experience and really live into in this life. This is such a powerful story that even people that aren't actively Christian people uh, are compelled by it. I think of, to paraphrase the Jewish German philosopher, uh, Hannah Arndt, who is, uh, was not herself a Christian. Some people argue that she wasn't even religious, even though she wrote about it a lot. She herself, to, to paraphrase her, says, the source of our understanding of forgiveness is the Bible in general, and it's the teachings of Jesus in particular. 
I know a lot of Christians that couldn't enunciate that quite as clearly. Uh, now, in week four, we're going to see how we apply the, the principles of forgiveness to our life. But for now, especially as Christians, I think we need to define forgiveness through Christ as we see him revealed in Scripture. So let's look again at Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. Let me just read this again. This is, this is too juicy of a passage to just kind of read one time and not focus on a lot. The Lord passed in front of Moses and proclaimed the Lord. Starts with his own name, his own identity. The Lord is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth and maintaining faithful love to thousands of generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. But he will not leave the guilty unpunished bringing the consequences that the father's iniquity on the children and the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. Now, this is really, I think, one of the most important passages in the entire Old Testament. In fact, when I was thinking about doing this study, which we were originally supposed to do back in the spring, but it got delayed, I was thinking of just having a Bible study in these two verses, Exodus 34, 6, and 7, and just going through each of these attributes. God is gracious. He's compassionate slow to anger. We would be well worth our time to spend, you know, six weeks in that. But I say that this is so important because this appears all over the Old Testament. Commit this passage to memory. When you read through the Bible again in the coming year, whenever you're doing your Bible study, look for this description in the Old Testament you will see it over and over and over again. It appears almost verbatim in some places. Numbers 14, Psalm 86, Psalm 103, Psalm 145, Joel 2, Jonah 4, Micah 7, Nahum 1, Nehemiah 9. Oh, there's tons of other places too that just maybe use a couple words here and there. And so for the ancient Israelite people, they saw how important this, de- this definition of God is. It was a core part of their liturgy. This, these verses appeared in their daily prayers and their special holiday celebrations. And as Christians, it should be obvious to us why it's so important of a passage. It is a seismic revelation from God himself about who God is. You know, when you get to know somebody, when you meet someone, you say, tell me about yourself. How many brothers and sisters do you have? What do you do for a job? Tell me about who you are. This is God doing that exactly for us. This is God saying, I am the Lord. I am who I am. And this is what makes me me. And so we should pay attention to this. Now, what's equally interesting for his self-revelation in this moment is the context for why he says it. Now, just as a little background, and you can, if you want to, just kind of, you can Flip through Exodus as you're following along, but just listen to. This is after the Lord has freed Israel from slavery. We see that in the first 18 chapters of the book of Exodus. You see all those great stories. We had a sermon series on that a couple years ago. We saw how he walked with them through the Red Sea. He fed them in the wilderness. He went ahead of them as a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. He's camped with them at Mount Sinai for a short period of time where he's given them the law and a covenant with tabernacle designs and a class of priest. He has given them, he has called people to be their ministers, called people to be their builders. He is establishing a people group here. And in so doing, he has ratified all of this uh, and their identity as his people, and he is their God. So it is clear from the first, gosh, I don't know, I think maybe the first 20 six, I want to say, uh, chapters of Exodus. He rescues them and sets them up for who they're supposed to be and says, you know, this is, this, is, uh, uh, this is who you are and this is who I am. And we are a people together. I am your God and you are my people. It's really kind of a divine jackpot in the ancient history. There's really no story like it, even in other ancient and antiquated books. Here's a people that were a slave people. They were foreigners to Egypt, and they were slaves, and they had no advocates, they had no power, no money, no really culture of their own, and they were almost non-existent, other than just to be uh, brick makers for the Egyptians who built monuments. They had nothing. 
And then this God from out of nowhere swoops in, destroys their enemy, goes one by one and snipes each one of Egypt's gods who oppresses them dead and takes them into a new land and gives them everything. It's astonishing, this story. Paradise has been found, it would seem. But then, in just a matter of days, from all this glory and goodness happening, they reject it all to make and worship an idol. They have the living God on their side, who has said, who are you? I am. (laughs) You can't get much more higher than that. He doesn't say, oh, I'm the storm god, or I'm the, the wind god, I'm the, I am, you know, Tiamat, that great serpent that fought Marduk and the, he doesn't, he's nothing like that. He is, I am who I am. All those other false gods are bow down before him. He's, he's greater than anything they conceive. His own name is just me. <laughs> That's a powerful God. And yet they have that God on their side. Instead, they craft a baby cow made of scrap metal and worship it instead. (laughs) The Lord, for the first time in the scriptures, when he sees this, he gets angry. That's interesting. We think of God as kind of hair trigger and he's angry. He is all the things that Moses and the people have done uh, or, or Abraham and his people, Adam and his family. God has never been angry. But this point, he gets angry because he's revealed who he is, has given them everything, and they've rejected him. But Moses intercedes, and we see a new theme develop, that when a mediator comes between God and a sinner and pleads for the sinner, God is quick to listen and slow to anger, as that passage just said. God, with total forgiveness, relents. He wanted to wipe Israel off the map and say, Moses, I'll do all this with you. I did it with Abraham. I did it with Adam. I can do it with you too. But Moses prays for these sinners and God fully pardons Israel. Just like that. He went to court on this thundering volcanic mountain of Sinai. And God says, I'm going to kill him, Moses. He said, don't do it. And God says, okay. None of us could is, is that gracious. Nobody's like that. So here, only after he fully pardons Israel for all of her sins of selfishness and ingratitude, God then describes himself. We cannot miss that this description of God that he reveals to us about who he really is comes after that moment. God reveals himself fully around his ability to forgive greatly. Let's look look closer at these attributes. They're all spokes radiating from the wheel of forgiveness, it would seem. Compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love and truth. Yet, he is consequentially just still, but more than that, he is good. All of these descriptors, in some sense, are most fully applied when some party is in the wrong it, or, or on a lesser status. You can't be compassionate to someone who's on equal standing with you. They have to be lacking something. You can't be gracious and giving something to somebody if they have it all. You can't be slow to anger or patient if they don't test that patience. You can't be abounding in faithful love and truthfulness to a people that are hateful and and self-deceptive, all of that has to do, all of those descriptors, although they're eternally true of God, uh, historically come to bear in the fact that he's a forgiving God. All of these traits have to do with forgiveness in some way. And we see these things on full display in the acts of forgiveness he does all over the Old Testament. Very quick survey. In Genesis, the Lord told Adam and Eve, uh, the day they eat of the forbidden tree, by the way, the only restriction he gave them, he gave them everything in the world. He says, just don't go here. And that's exactly where they go. They had had it better off than we could possibly ever fathom or imagine. He said, just don't do this one thing. And that's the first thing they did. Uh, If you do that, you'll die. On that day, you'll die. 
Augustine and other theologians interpret this as not only physical death, but spiritual death. They would die, body and soul. And eventually that is what happened to them because they did disobey. But when they did sin, God did not act in the way that we would have anticipated anybody else to act. He said, if you do it, you will die. And they did it, but he helped them. Now, they, the consequences did come to them. They were, you know, Adam had to work until he was hobbled over, you know, just a shell of an old man from what he once was. Eve would have to go through the pain of childbirth and all the pains of, uh, 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 of submission and domesticity that just haunt women to this day. They, they passed down all that curse to us. But God, when they did that, he did not kill them and start over with Adam 2.0, and upgraded Eve. He helped them. Why? Because, as he tells us, he's compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love and truth, and forgiving of all iniquity, rebellion, and sin. That's why he did it. They didn't know that at the time, but that's why he did it. Again, Next generation, the Lord warns Cain, don't kill your brother. I can see that brewing beneath you is a sin even worse than your parents. You want to blaspheme me by destroying my image and you want to murder your brother who is your neighbor and a fellow image bearer. Don't do it. And he does. And God still helps him. He protects Cain even though he's a murderer. God helps these sinners. He helps and rescues Noah the drunk, Abraham the adulterer, Jacob the deceiver, Joseph the naive. Why? Because these people, although they're more trouble quite literally than they're worth, are still the children of a God who is compassionate and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth and forgiving of iniquities. God is grieved, Genesis 6, by all of humanity's endless sins. (laughs) He sees that the the contents of our brains and our hearts are just death and hell and destruction all the time. And that grieves him. Doesn't anger him, interestingly. Doesn't say it angers him. It grieves him because he is a God that loves to be compassionate and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in faithful. I'm going to say that a lot tonight if you haven't caught that already, because the scriptures say it a lot. And yet Genesis 50, we see that after the Lord um, has rescued all these people that don't deserve it, we see that act of forgiveness now has trickled down into a sinful humanity. God is forgiven and forgiven and forgiven. And finally, an image bearer of God gets it. Joseph never says, aha, Eureka, I have found it. He doesn't, you know, but it's clear he understands the character of God. All of Genesis has been about humanity spiraling down, getting worse and worse and worse. But surprisingly, Joseph seems to be what Adam was always called to do. Joseph is the ruler of almost the whole known world. He is doing what God called Adam to do, to have dominion over the planet, to love and care for everything. And Joseph is doing that. But the only play, the only reason he came to that is because that cycle of sin led to the, his brothers hating him, deceiving their father, planning to kill him, selling him into slavery. He's lied about by the uh, by the uh, the elites in Egypt. He's forgotten by the servants in Egypt. But God raises him up, anyways. And so his brothers come to their ruler brother and ask something that they can't possibly imagine he'll do. Please, Nasa, our sin. This Hebrew word means lift up and carry away the burden of what we've done to you. And Joseph, having dominion over the world like Adam was supposed to have, he does it. Joseph does what God made human beings to do, to forgive. Because Joseph, although he may not know much of anything else, he knows a lot about the Lord. And he's able to forgive like God forgives. That that forgiveness, that streak of forgiveness, continues on through Aaron and the priest, kafaring the sins of Israel. Kafar is the word that means cover over transgression, painting blood over it. 
covering over the stain by putting the stain of blood, sacrificial blood in its place. We see that in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. We see the kings and sages of Israel from David to Solomon, from Isaiah and, and, and Job and all these people in the Psalms and writings and prophets constantly remind the wayward people that the Lord is the one who uh, uh, forgives them when they have sinned. He will salak them is a word that's used, Hebrew word that means to remove their blame. Nasa, kafar, salak, they all have to do with forgiveness and its dynamics. And why is this? Because the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love and truth and forgiving iniquity, sin, and rebellion. We see these same ideas again and again in the Old Testament. Lightning round, strap in. Psalm 32, how joyful is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Psalm 130, if you kept an account of iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But with you there's forgiveness so that you may be revered. Jeremiah 31, for I will forgive their iniquity and never again remember their sin. Isaiah 33, for the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. The people who dwell with him will be forgiven their iniquity. 1 Kings 8, hear the petition of your servant and your people Israel. May you hear in your dwelling place in heaven. May you hear and forgive. This goes on and on and on and on in the Old Testament. And all of this is such psychologically and spiritually serious work. The authors realize deep down, this is a component, especially in the Psalms, of a deep need for forgiveness. They've sinned. And it separated them from the human community and separated them from the Godhead. And so they need reconciliation. They need restoration. The problem that sin has, uh, more than anything, has created a rift between them and God and them and others. There is a moral debt. They have done something to take good away from others, take God's blessing away from others. They owe that back to those people that they stole it from. So they need God to forgive them so that they can inwardly not only live in godly fear and reverence of who the Lord is, but now also in neighborly righteousness, restoring to people. This is jumping to the New Testament, but when Zacchaeus is forgiven of much sin uh, from and his primary human earthly sin is stealing from people, he goes and restores back to them fourfold. I know we don't want to talk about that, but that is what forgiveness works out in people, where you restore and reconcile. And once they're restored to God, they can be reconciled to the human race. Now, Folks, this is just a scattershot survey of the Old Testament. I had so much more in here, but I, we're, we're running out of time as is now. And so I, we've barely even scratched the surface. So let's tie some of these Old Testament ideas together. Let's tie this Exodus thing together. First, since Adam and Eve, we've all been trapped in cycles of individual and, and, and societal systemic sin. That means both individually and personally, we are guilty of sins. And even passively, societally, corporately, we're culpable for, uh, for allowing sins to continue uh, under our name and in, uh, as representative of us, as people groups. I mean, that is so obvious that we hardly have to even prove that. I don't, I don't even, even need, really need to give you historical current event examples of how that is. And second, we see that sin creates death and division, both physically and spiritually from God and others. So we've been trapped in this cycle of sin since the very beginning of the human race, and it's creating, or rather uncreating us, and by putting, plunging us into death, putting us into division with one another, and sin is just begetting sin. We are hurt by sin, and then we hurt sinners back. We, we uh, wound their pride with our retaliation, and then they wound ours. We all disobey God together and fight against one another until, I mean, we're all dead. It, it's, it, we are all living in a spiritual Hatfields and McCoys world. We are, just, we are extinguishing and annihilating each other, and we won't stop doing it. But there is something that can get us to stop, and that is the fact that God forgives. He nasas. He takes away the weight of our sin. He kafars. He covers the stains of it. He salaks. He removes our moral blame from us. Why? 
because the Lord is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth and forgiving sin and rebellion and iniquity. Here's the beauty. As God forgives us and invites us into his life because he's forgiven us, because God's forgiven us, we can come to the Lord's Supper table. Uh, because God's forgiven us, we can come to the great throne room and bring him praise and prayer. Because God has forgiven us, he is, Jesus is our elder brother. His father is our father. We are in the family of God. We are co-heirs and co-rulers with Christ. We have been welcomed into God's own personal life. Because God forgives us and invites us into his community, then gradually we become like him and can do the same for others. As Christians, we'll begin to forgive like God does. We'll be like Joseph, who lifts the burden off his brothers, who covers the sting of it, and who removes the blame from their account. When you're with God and he's forgiven you enough and you realize he's forgiven you that much, you can then in turn start to forgive like he forgives. It's possible. He made you to be his image bearer. If you bear God's holy and divine stamp, then he'll give you the power to reflect his attributes to one another. You are not inherently gracious, but you can be inclined to generosity. We may not in on of ourselves be compassionate, but God can shape us to be deeply empathetic. He will change our actions and our attitudes until we reflect his gospel and his attributes. We'll be patient in the healing process, slow to anger. We'll be deeply committed and loving We'll be faithful. We'll be fully sincere. We'll be truthful. We'll be able to forgive sin and rebellion and iniquity and transgressions in one another because he's forgiven us. Now, just as a quick but essential aside, our Exodus passage also says that God still does not clear the unrepentant guilty, and sometimes that goes to third and fourth generation. His love goes to thousands of generations, but his justice does go to the third or fourth. That may not seem like a big deal, but God is, when yes, God is hair-triggered. He's hair-triggered in his forgiveness, not his wrath. We, the, the caricature of God from the Old Testament is as soon as you do something wrong, God wants to kill you. But really, as soon as you repent of the wrong you've done, even though you're going to repent a billion more times in this life, God says, I forgive you, before you can even get the words out. That's where he's hair-triggered in. But for some cases... For people that continue on in their sin and pass that on to their children, their sin continue, their, their children continue in that sin, their grandchildren, when it comes in those kind of cycles, God does allow for that to go on so that it can be punished. We're not going to deal with that tonight, but that is a truth of the matter. In our human society, likewise, uh, we are called to be administrators of righteousness, aka justice. And so sometimes, even secular authorities, non-Christian, non-religious uh, institutions have to intervene to put an end to injustice. That has to, that's a tragic reality for people who refuse to repent. We will get to that idea more. But what I want us to see so clearly is the nature and character of God all over the Old Testament. And now as we turn to the new in just a minute is to forgive and forgive and forgive. So let's turn to the New Testament, where forgiveness finds its focal point in Jesus Christ. Let's look at Mark chapter 1, verse 4. Again, the first gospel, and by that I mean the first that was written, at least I believe, Mark begins this way and telling the story. Verse 4, it says, John the Baptist, in parentheses, John came baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of what? Of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Again, if Moses is the first major Old Testament prophet, then John is the last. And he has a special role within that prophetic uh, uh, duty and office that he holds. One that Jesus even esteemed himself. Jesus said that nobody ever was born greater or did greater work than John did. And why is that, uh, or what is it that John does that's so unique? <laughs> well, John has a very special privilege 
And his special privilege, by the way, cost him his head off his shoulders. <laughs> That's how God uses his servants sometimes, is that the great roles that they do to usher in his proclamation of gospel is costly to them. John is the forerunner. He comes right before the Savior and consolation of Israel, the heir of David, the Son of Man, the Messiah, to say, there he finally is. He literally does that in one of his sermons. He says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Do you know how much Jeremiah or Ezekiel or Micah or Amos would love to have pointed to that person they were anticipating? John gets to do that. John's ministry begins like any of his Old Testament counterparts. He comes doing some of the same things. He's out in the wilderness. When we think of the prophets, man, these guys are like, they're crazy people. You know, I I hate to say it. Sometimes when we see those Street preachers that are standing in Atlanta are now, you know, you think big cities, but now you see that in Snellville and Loganville and, you know, Lilburn, Lawrenceville. You see these people, they have ragged clothes and they're, they're preaching on the streets. Now, sometimes the message I'll stop and listen to is not the, quite the gospel message. I know it comes from a good place. There are probably people that love the Lord. However, that kind of off-putting sort of not dressed properly, seems like they just came out of the wilderness screaming about God is kind of what the prophets were like. And so here's John eating bugs and covered in sticky honey sap, wearing matted furs, looking like the wolf man from the Universal Monster movie pictures, just looking like a deranged man comes, but he's doing something so important. He's baptizing in the wilderness. Now, that's a different kind of baptism than the one we practice as Christians, although we see and in some sense reenact some of its traits. But he's coming to ritually purify the people. He is not yet baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. We know that because in Acts, we see a group of his disciples that don't fully know about Jesus that are preaching the same message that John is, and they didn't even know what had happened and, and, and Jerusalem, they didn't know the full story of Jesus. The disciples, the apostles, the early Christians had to teach them the full story of that. So he is purifying them ritually. In other words, he's preparing them religiously for this moment. And he proclaims to them repentance. That is, he's preaching, he's prophesying, turn away from what you're doing and, turns towards the, and turn towards the Lord. And he is preaching the forgiveness of sins. He's preaching the good news that Jesus would embody in his own life and ministry. Now, the biggest difference is that John the Baptist, again, is able, from all his other counterparts, is able to pinpoint all of those shadowy images, things that we read about, the the sufferings. Who's this suffering servant? Old Testament Jews did not know who that would be. They didn't know who would be the root of Jesse, the key of David, the good shepherd, the returning king, the great high priest, the seed of Eve, the son of man. They knew somebody like that would appear, but they didn't know who it was. All of this, all of these different descriptors has one thing in common. This person, whoever it is, this Messiah acts as a forgiving mediator between God and humanity. And he now gets to point with his bony long finger, this real historical flesh and blood person, Jesus of Nazareth, is he. The religious preparation, the biblical preaching, the personal repentance, and therefore its divine forgiveness of sin, all is for and to and from and by Jesus, says John. And so the message of Jesus is the good news of forgiveness. Forgiveness for all kinds of people. In the ministry of Jesus, we see forgiveness of prostitutes, forgiveness of tax collectors, forgiveness of pagans, forgiveness of the demon-possessed, forgiveness of, uh, of, the, of the Roman centurions and their police brutality, forgiveness of all manner of kinds of, and kinds of people. The message of Jesus is good news for anybody that will turn from sin and turn to him they will find that no matter what they've done, who they are, any other incriminating details of their history, they can simply repent from all that and believe and they 
by Jesus will be saved. You can. This is the message of Jesus for us now. You can turn from sin and death and hell and the enemy unto Jesus, even in meager, struggling faith in the gospel, the kingdom, and God himself will be and are now yours. That's forgiveness. He offers remissions of all sins. He offers the paying off of all debts. He offers to get out of the, or to get out from under the law that is crushing you, under the gospel that is a, is a sweet shade with a cool breeze and a drink of water on a brutally hot day. All that is a new type of forgiveness that only he can provide, and yet it's still the same old Nisa and Kafar and Salak because it comes from the same God, now in Jesus, who is compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love and truth, and forgiving sin and iniquity and transgression and rebellion, and you name it. When we ask what forgiveness is, this is where we have to start in our understanding. You will find through so many, and I'm convinced that the older I've gotten, the more I've realized that a lot of people that I think are wrong-headed are well-meaning people. They're not out to deceive or trick you. Now, some of them are. Tons of them are, maybe. But some people, in their own desperate search for truth, love to come up with all this sort of you know, self-care mumbo-jumbo about what forgiveness is. It's very, it's like a Hollywood movie script. It sounds nice, but it's not really what forgiveness is. There's tons of that out in this world today. So when we as Christians start to talk about what forgiveness is, this is where we have to begin. We have to let the Bible define it for us. And if we want to see what it looks like in practice, we have to look to Jesus. If we don't get that right about forgiveness, what it is, according to God in the scripture, through Christ, everything else we're going to talk about next, even how, what it's not, how we apply it, what God does, we're, it's, it's going to be a mess. So we have to understand that. Forgiveness starts here in Christ as revealed in scripture. But we've also seen some facets and characteristics. If you're like me, I like to have tangible things to hold on to, tangible ideas to meditate on. And here they are. These are the attributes and actions of forgiveness. It is the nasawing. It's the lifting of a burden. It is the covering over a sin. It is the removing of blame. That is what forgiveness is. And all its ultimate fulfillments come to us past, present, and future through the cross of Jesus Christ. It's then and there that he makes our absolution a sure thing and makes our ability to forgive in the way that God forgives with compassion and grace and patience and faithfulness and truth. He makes us able to do that because he has done that for us. When Jesus tells us then in his parables and his preaching that we can, even must, forgive people, then we know even if we were ever and we may one day be in Mr. Weisenthal's unenviable position where somebody has hurt us beyond imagining. The people, I think, these the amazing Christian people that are coming out of Ukraine and Russia and, and Palestine, Israel now, that despite the bloodshed, despite the brutality, the murdering and bombing of children and elderly people, the destruction of cultures and histories and families, the people coming out of that, even through all the post-traumatic stress of it, and are still able to forgive, are able to do so authentically because Jesus has been able to forgive the human race for putting the Lord of glory to death. We can truly say, I forgive you, and live it out. It will not be easy. You'll have to die to yourself in order to forgive, really. But because the Lord is compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love and truth, and forgiving of all sins, iniquities, transgressions, and rebellions, then we can do that too. Let's pray. Lord, we love and thank you for forgiving us so thoroughly in Christ. Help us to be like him, to show the world who you are.
And when we forgive, as we have been forgiven, help us to repent and believe still in this gospel of forgiveness for us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, and only by the Spirit's power can we do any of this. Amen.